A very good evening aspirants welcome to the Hindu newspaper analysis brought to you by Shankar IAS Academy for the date 16th of March 2022 See from Shankar IAS Academy we are happy to inform you that we are starting the next prefit batch See this batch is called as prefit rapid morning evening batch The entrance test will be conducted on 20th March 2022 note this date again it will be conducted on 20th March 2022 The entrance exam can be attempted in both online and offline modes. See the entrance exam time will be from 2:30 p.m. to 4:30 p.m. at all Shankaraya's Academy centers and online. See the program starts on 28th March 2022. In order to facilitate students there are morning and evening batches in both online and offline formats. The course duration is from 28th March 2022 To 29 May 2022, you will be having a total number of 45 tests. This includes three mock tests as well. See the course fees for the prefit general is rupees 2,499, and this amount includes the GST amount also. And the course fees for prefit with scholarship based on performance in the entrance exam is rupees 1,250, and this amount also includes the GST amount. I'll remind you again the entrance exam will be conducted on 20th March 2022 between the timing 2:30 p.m. and 4:30 p.m. at all Shankar IAS Academy centers and online please make use of it and for more information on registration please use the link given in the description and with this information now let us take a look at the articles that we are going to discuss today the first article here is about the judgment regarding wearing hijab in the educational institutions we were all waiting for the judgment and it came and another's article discussion we are going to cover extensively the issue of wearing hijab moving on to the next article see this article is about the renewable energy solar we all know india is a tropical country and it is rich of solar energy resource so under this article discussion we are going to see different types and we are going to see the issues that the sector faces Now moving on to the third article. See as the names suggest, yeah, we are going to see the freedom fighters Bahad Singh, Sukhdev, and Rajguru, and we are going to see some of the cases that they are involved with. And the next article here is about the governor giving assent to the state legislature bill. So we are going to cover the constitutional provisions regarding this, and we are going to see recommendation of the commission Punchi. And this final article here. is about a dispute between two states regarding the river krishna so we are not going to discuss the issue here we are going to see the river krishna its origin tributaries from prelims point of view without any delay let's get into the article discussion look at this front page article here this news article states that the karnataka high court on tuesday upheld the ban on wearing of hijab by students in schools and colleges See the court held that wearing the hijab is not an essential religious practice in Islam and so it is not protected under the right to freedom of religion guaranteed by article 25 of the constitution see the bench also upheld the legality of the Karnataka government's order prescribing guidelines for uniforms in schools and pre university colleges and this is the crux of the article given here and in this context let's learn about hijab and some of the important points in the judgment but before that the syllabus relevant to the article is given here for your reference please go through it see before starting our discussion i want you to take a look at this question here it was asked in the year 2017 in the gs2 paper See the question says that examine the scope of fundamental rights in the light of the latest judgment of the Supreme Court on right to privacy. We all know about the Puttasamy case related to the right to privacy, right? So when that judgment came, a question related to that judgment was asked in the GS2 paper. And how this is relevant to what we are discussing now? See this is also a case which relates a constitutional provision that is the right to freedom article 25 of the constitution so you may expect a question related to this judgment also so each and every fact we are going to see is important see it is important for your prelims as well as for your mains take a note of the points that we are going to discuss today and pay close attention now let's start our discussion see the origin of hijab is from the arabic word hijaba 
which means to hide hijab refers to the head coverings owned by muslim women see there are a lot of different kinds of coverings owned by muslim women all over the world here hijab refers to a cloth wrapped around the head and neck but leaves the face uncovered there is also another type which is the chador it is a full body length shawl leaving only the face exposed and there is also another one which is called as niqab which is a veil that covers the head neck and most of the face except the eyes now unlike a niqab a burqa covers the face entirely while leaving a mesh screen in front of the eyes now these are the different types of coverings worn by muslim women all over the world now let's see what is the issue here see six students were banned from entering a college in karnataka's udupi district for wearing a hijab they were told to take off their hijab before entering the classroom the protest started against this ban in january on february 5th the karnataka government issued an order stating that uniforms must be worn compulsorily where the policies exist and no exception can be made for the wearing of hijab See several educational institutions cited this order and denied entry to muslim girls wearing the hijab so the petitions were filed in the karnataka high court on behalf of the aggrieved students they sought the right to wear hijabs in classrooms under what are all the articles yeah you are right they sought the right to wear hijabs in classrooms under article 14 19 and 25 of the constitution of india What is Article Fourteen? It is equality before law and equal protection of laws. And what is Article Nineteen? It is the freedom of speech and expression, assembly, association, movement, residence, and profession. And what is Article Twenty Five? It is the freedom of conscience and free profession, practice, and propagation of religion. Here, note that the rights under Article Twenty Five are subject to public order, morality. health and other provisions relating to the fundamental rights so the government order issued on february 5th under the karnataka education act 1983 see the order states that public order is one of the reasons for not allowing students to wear a head scarf in the educational institutions see after this order the issue throws up legal questions on the freedom of religion and whether the right to wear a hijab is constitutionally protected or not See just now we saw that article 25 of the constitution guarantees the freedom of conscience and the right to freely profess practice and propagate a religion. Now we'll discuss about the judgment of the Karnataka High Court. See the judgment was delivered by a three judge bench. The court rejected all the petitions filed by nine Muslim girl students of two government pre-university colleges in Udupi district. The bench also upheld the legality of the Karnataka government's order prescribing guidelines for uniforms in schools and pre-university colleges under the provisions of Karnataka Education Act 1983. So basically the high court said that you have to follow the government's order and the petitions by the aggrieved students were rejected. See the bench first analyzed the holy book Quran for the analysis of Quran the bench relied on the book the holy Quran text translation and commentary by abdullah yusuf ali after analyzing this text the bench said that the era before the introduction of islam is known as jahiliya which was a time of barbarism and ignorance so the quran shows concern for the cases of molestation of innocent women so it recommended wearing of hijab and other apparel as a measure of social security apparel here is nothing but a piece of cloth or cloth but in today's modern world whether it holds the same significance or not is the question see the bench said that wearing hijab is much less essential to the islamic faith the bench observed that the holy quran does not mandate wearing of hijab for muslim women and there is sufficient intrinsic material within the scripture itself to support the view that wearing hijab is only recommendatory So citing these reasons the court said that wearing a hijab is not protected under the right to freedom of religion guaranteed by article 25 of the constitution See we know that this order can be challenged in the high court right the students can appeal this to the supreme court and if they appeal it will have to wait for the final judgment of the supreme court and that's all regarding this news article here now we'll have a quick recap 
what all we saw in this discussion we saw about hijab what is that it is a cloth wrapped around the head and neck but leaves the face uncovered and we also saw other kinds of coverings worn by muslim women which is the chador niqab and burqa and after that we saw about the issue which is students were banned from entering a college in karnataka's udupi district for wearing a hijab and they filed petitions in the karnataka high court and they sought the right to wear hijabs in the classrooms under article 14 19 and 25 of the constitution and after this we saw about article 14 article 19 and article 25 of the constitution which is nothing but equality before law equal protection of laws freedom of speech and expression assembly association movement residence and profession freedom of conscience and free profession practice and propagation of religion respectively and finally we ended our discussion by seeing the judgment of the karnataka high court the court upheld the legality of the karnataka government's order prescribing uniforms in colleges and schools the the bench analyzed quran and said that quran shows concern for the cases of molestation of innocent women and recommended wearing of hijab the court also said that in today's world it is questionable whether it holds the same significance or not and the bench also observed that quran does not mandate wearing of hijab it is only recommendatory and said that there is sufficient intrinsic material within the scripture itself with these key points in mind let's move on to the next article discussion see in this text in context article the status of india solar energy installed capacity has been discussed along with this the issues in solar sector have also been mentioned so today let us see about what is solar energy india's commitment towards it and some of the existing issues in the sector but before that the syllabus relevant to the article is given here for your reference please go through it see before we start our discussion take a look at these questions here see the first question is a mains question asked in the year 2016 in the general studies third paper what is the question about give an account of the current status and targets to be achieved pertaining to the renewable energy sources in the country and the second question it is a question that was asked very recently in the year 2020 it is asked in gs1 see what does it say india has immense potential for solar energy though there are regional variations in its development elaborate see the second question is directly related to the article that we are going to discuss today the first question here it is about the current status and targets to be achieved pertaining to renewable energy sources after going through these questions now you know how important these kind of articles are see these kind of question comes under energy and also under environment see when such a question is asked you can give data or statistics about the solar energy capacity or the commitments that we have these points will enrich your answer and it is useful for your prelims also and with this awareness now let's start our discussion see the solar power or solar energy is the energy from the sun this is converted into thermal or electrical energy and note that the solar energy is the cleanest and most abundant renewable energy source available it is the most readily available and free source of energy right note that india receives solar energy of 5 to 7 kilowatt hour per meter square for 300 to 330 days in a year this is abundant amount of energy so harnessing this energy is an important policy of the government of india in this manner india already achieved fifth global position in the solar power deployment by surpassing italy This was made possible by the fastest rate of growth in India's renewable energy capacity addition. Particularly as per the government data, solar energy expanded over 18 times during the last 7 and a half years. Here look at the table as on November 2021, India's installed renewable energy capacity stood at 150.54 gigawatt. and clearly we can see that india achieved its cop21 commitments so what were the commitments as part of the nationally determined contributions india committed to achieve 40 percentage of its installed electricity capacity from non fossil energy sources by 2030 as you can see this was achieved in november 2021 itself right then again in cop26 india committed to achieving 
500 gigawatt of installed electricity capacity from non fossil fuel sources by the year 2030 so the government is again trading towards achieving this and according to the article india has made progress in this manner particularly in solar energy as of last week india achieved more than 50 gigawatt solar installed capacity here the last 10 gigawatt of capacity was added in 2021 itself this is nearly 200 percentage year on year growth this rapid progress promises that india will achieve its commitments and targets now in this image you can see the information of category wise installed capacity see it includes solar power bio small hydro wind power nuclear hydro and thermal see it is a recent statistics because it is the data of the year 2022 you can use this number in your mains answer now coming back to the article see there are certain hurdles in the path that we have to overcome to understand the hurdles we need to know how solar energy is harnessed through the technology solar energy can be utilized through two different routes namely solar thermal route and the solar electric route the solar electric route is also called as the solar photovoltaic route now let's see the solar thermal route this route uses the sun's heat to produce hot water or air and it uses the sun's heat to cook food or even to dry materials etc on the other hand solar photovoltaic which is shortly referred as pv converts the sunlight directly into electricity it uses sun's heat to produce electricity for lighting home and building for running motors electric appliances etc this is among the fastest growing segments of the renewable energy industry here large scale pv plants are used for electricity generation that is fed into the grid such systems consist of one or more pv panels a dc or ac power converter or inverter mounting fixtures electrical interconnections etc the electricity that is generated is either stored or used directly for self consumption or is fed into large electricity grids which are called as the grid connected projects see these grid connected projects they are of two types one is the ground mounted pv see the name itself explains what it is the panels will be mounted on the ground the next one is rooftop pv see this one saves space and could be installed in many places such as schools hospitals storehouses railway stations etc and then we also have off grid pv this is for those places where grid has not reached or the areas where electricity supply is poor so mainly the rural areas and there is also micro mini grid for village electrification the micro grids are modern small scale versions of the centralized electricity system they generate distribute and regulate the flow of electricity to consumers locally among these majority capacity is of the ground mounted pv systems that is 42 gigawatt capacity and rooftop pv is of 6.48 gigawatt and a meager is from off grid solar pv which is 1.48 gigawatt see from this data you would have a doubt of why rooftop pv has low installed capacity even though it has promising features right see this is due to the limited financing for the residential consumers and small and medium enterprises that is smes who want to install it for example in residential sector higher electrical financial assistance of up to 40 percentage is given for rooftop systems up to 3 kilowatt capacity but the author is saying this amount is insufficient secondly electricity distribution companies that is the discoms also have staggered response for net metering for the rooftop systems see solar pv systems generate power only during daytime when sun is available in net metered systems the generated power is utilized for self consumption and the excess power is exported to the grid as long as the grid is available in case where the solar power is not sufficient due to cloud cover or other reasons power is drawn from the grid to power the loads so here energy is exported at one instance 
and imported at another instance here energy flow is in both directions it can be also called as bidirectional these bidirectional energy flow is recorded in the net meter and at the end of the billing period net energy used is calculated the beneficiary has to pay for only the net energy used so this is important in any of the rooftop systems but the unresponsive behavior of the discoms are hindering the installation of rooftop systems and then there are also issues in utility scale solar pv sector a utility scale solar facility is one which generates solar power and feeds it into the grid they face the challenge of land cost high transmission and distribution losses that is the tnd losses etc here the tnd losses represent electricity that is generated but does not reach the intended customers so to reap the benefits of the solar sector the issues have to be addressed first but then as a conclusion author also suggests to move towards a circular economy first now we'll see what is this circular economy so it is a model of production and consumption which involves sharing leasing reusing repairing refurbishing and recycling existing materials and products as long as possible in this way the life cycle of products is extended and it tackles the global challenges like climate change biodiversity loss waste and pollution through this solar pv waste can be recycled and reused and this will reduce the overall cost in the solar energy installations and with this we have come to the end now we'll have a quick recap see firstly we saw about the solar energy which is the energy from sun and it is converted into thermal or electrical energy and after that we saw about the installed renewable energy capacity which is 150.54 gigawatt as on november 2021 and after that we saw an image of category wise installed capacity as on 2022 and after that we saw the two routes through which solar energy can be utilized the first one is solar thermal route and second one is solar electrical route which is nothing but the solar photovoltaic route and as a sub category we saw two major grid connected projects which is ground mounted pv and rooftop pv and we also saw about the off grid pv micro mini grid for the village electrification and finally we saw about the issues and we ended our conversation by seeing the circular economy which is a model of production and consumption which involves sharing leasing reusing repairing recycling the existing materials and products as long as possible with these key takeaway points let's move on to the next article discussion look at this news article here see a question was asked by an mp to the ministry of home affairs what was that question why the freedom fighters bahat singh shukadev and rajguru had not been given martyr status see the minister of state for home mr rajay kumar mishra informed the lok sabha that the statue of bahat singh shukadev and rajguru was far above any award or title or status The minister said the nation will always be grateful to them who laid down their lives for a better future for India and their names will be written in golden words in the Indian history. In this context let us learn about these freedom fighters in prelims perspective. See in the prelims more weightage is given to modern India. And in modern India the events happened between 1905 and 1947 is extremely important. So in our discussion today We are going to see the ideology that is followed by Bahat Singh, Sukhdev, and Rajguru, and some of the important cases that involves them. Now let's start our discussion. See, the revolutionary activity in Punjab, Uttar Pradesh, and Bihar was dominated by Hindustan Republican Association, simply HRA. See, the HRA was founded in October 1924 in Kanpur by Ram Prasad Bismil, Jogesh Chandra Chatterjee, Sachin Sanyal. with an aim to organize an armed revolution to overthrow the colonial government the most important action of the hra was the kakori robbery see hra men held up the train at kakori near lucknow and looted its official railway cash here loot means the act of stealing so after the event it led to the arrest of many members of hra four members bismil 
அஸ்வகுல்லா ரோஷன் சிங் அண்ட் ராஜேந்திர லஹிரி வேர் ஹேங்ட் தே வேர் ஹேங்ட் டு டெத் சோ கக்கோரி ராபரி ப்ரூவ் டு பி அ செட் பேக் ஃபார் ஹெச் ஆர் ஏ அண்ட் ஆஃப்டர் திஸ் the anger revolutionaries they were determined to overcome the kakori setback they set out to reorganize hindustan republic association at a historic meeting in the ruins of ferosh kotla in delhi on september 1928 see we saw that hra was established in the year 1924 and it was reorganized in the year 1928 under the leadership of chandrashekar azad the name of hra was changed to hindustan socialist republican association hsra the participants of the association included bahad singh sukhdev bhagwati charan vohra from punjab and bijay kumar sinha shiv verma and jaydev kapoor from the united provinces see the hsra decided to work under the collective leadership and they adopted socialism as its official goal and after this the death of lala lajpat rai due to lati blows received during a lati charge because of the anti simon commission procession angered the revolutionaries bahad singh azad and rajguru the shot saunders saunders is the police official responsible for the lati charge in lahur and this incident is famously known as lahur conspiracy case see if a question is asked related to lahur conspiracy case you have to remember these facts what is lahur conspiracy case it is the murder of saunders by bahad singh asa then rajguru and who is saunders he was the police official responsible for lati charge in lahur and why this lati charge was given it was because of the anti simon commission protest and lala lajpat rai died in this now coming back see later bahad singh and batukeshwar dat were asked to throw a bomb in the central legislative assembly on april 8 1929 it was to protest against the passage of public safety bill and trade disputes bill aimed at curtailing civil liberties of citizens in general and workers in particular the bombs had been deliberately made harmless and were aimed at making the deaf hear so the intention was not to kill anybody see the objective was to get arrested and use the trial court as a forum for propaganda so that people would become familiar with their movement and ideology see bahad singh sukhdev and rajguru were tried in the lahur conspiracy case lahur conspiracy case here is the murder of saunders and many other revolutionaries were tried in a series of other cases Asad was involved in a bid to blow up Viceroy Irwin's train near Delhi in December 1929. See Asad died in a police encounter in a park in Allahabad in February 1931. And Bahad Singh Sukhdev and Rajguru were hanged on March 23, 1931. And because of this every year March 23 is observed as Martyrs Day as a tribute to the freedom fighters Bahad Singh Sukhdev and Rajguru. and that's all regarding this news article we saw a lot of historical facts in this discussion and it will be useful for you in your prelims now we'll have a quick recap we saw about hindustan republican association which was founded in the year 1924 by ram prasad bismil yogesh chandra chatterji sachin sanyal the aim is to organize an armed revolution to overthrow the colonial government and after that we saw an important incident regarding this hra which is the kakori robbery which involves stealing of railway money and in the year 1928 hra was reorganized as hindustan socialist republican association and now the participants included anger revolutionaries such as bahad singh sukhdev bhagwati charan vohra vijay kumar sinha shiv verma jaydev kapoor And after that we saw about a famous case which is Lahu conspiracy case the murder of Saunders who is the police official responsible for the lati charge in Lahore and after that we saw the bomb incident in the central legislative assembly by Bahad Singh and Batukeshwar Dutt in 1929 on April 8 1929 and finally we saw that Bahad Singh Sukhdev and Rajguru were hanged on March 23 1931 and as a remembrance this day that is the March 23rd is observed as Martyrs Day every year with these key points in mind let's move on to the next article discussion see this news article here it is about the power of the governor to withhold assent to the bill passed by the state legislature 
See, there are debates on what should be the time limit to withhold the bill. So, in this regard, let us see the relevant constitutional provisions. See, the constitutional provision that deals with the assent of the governor for any bill is Article 200. As you know, when the bills are passed by the House or the Houses of the Legislature, it is then presented to the governor for his or her assent. And here, the governor has four choices. One is to give the assent. After the assent, the bill becomes an act. The second option is, he or she can withhold the assent. In this case, the bill ends there and it does not become an act. Now, the third choice is, he or she can reserve the bill for the consideration of the president. This can happen in three scenarios. What are they? When the bill passed by the state legislature endangers the position of state high court or when it ultra vies, that is, it is against the provisions of the constitution or when it is opposed to the directive principles of state policy. Note that after reserving the bill for the president's consideration, governor will not have any further role in the enactment of the bill. Afterwards, the president only will give the assent. And finally, he or she can resend the bill to the legislature for reconsideration and for making any amendments to the bill. Here note that he or she can return the bill only if it is not a money bill. Now this is where the problem lies. What will happen if the legislature passes the same bill again with or without any changes or amendments? Now for this, the article 200 has a clear answer. That is, here the governor is mandated to give the assent to the bill. And this is what happened in the case of Tamil Nadu, which is the news. City and assembly passed the neat exemption bill and sent it to governor for assent. But it was returned to the TN legislature for reconsideration. Then again, the TN assembly passed the same bill and sent it back to the governor for his assent. Now the governor is sitting on the bill. That is, he has not given the assent yet and have not forwarded it to the president for his assent. But just now we saw that when the same bill is passed again, governor has to give the assent. So anyhow, the TN governor has to approve the neat exemption bill. But how long can he delay the approval? That is his assent. See here, the constitution is silent. See, it is silent on the time limit for the governor's assent in such a scenario. Then what about commissions appointed by the government? See, several commissions have given recommendations regarding the time period for governor's decision. That is the decision to give assent or withhold or reserving it or returning to the legislature. Just know that one of the commissions is Punchi Commission, which was the second commission on center-state relations and it was set up in the year 2007. See, it recommended that the governor should take the decision within six months, that is whether to grant assent or to reserve it for the consideration of the president. But they do not talk about how long the governor can delay the approval in the second turn. That is, if the state legislature again sent back the bill to the governor, how long the governor can delay. See, this is because the constitution itself is clear on this matter and it mandates the governor to give assent. Now, that's all for this article discussion. What all we saw? We saw about the constitutional provision for giving assent to the state legislature bills by the governor, which is Article 200. And under that, we saw governor has four choices. One is to give assent. The second one is to withhold assent. The third one is to reserve the bill for the consideration of the president. And the fourth one is the governor can resend the bill to the legislature for reconsideration. See, if the bill is reserved by the governor for the consideration of the president, then it has to pass certain criteria. What are they? It should have provisions which endangers the position of the state high court or it should have provisions that is against the provisions of the constitution or it should have provisions which is opposed to the directive principles of state policy. And after that, we saw about the recommendation of Punchi Commission, which recommended that the governor should take the decision within six months, whether to grant assent or to reserve it for the consideration of the president. And with these points in mind, let's move on to the next article discussion. See this news article here. It talks about the river Krishna. See, the Telangana government has requested the Krishna River Management Board, that is the KRMB, to prevent Andhra Pradesh from drawing Tungabhadra water. Here, Krishna River Management Board is an autonomous body. It was established as per Andhra Pradesh Reorganization Act of 2014. The KRMB 
which is the autonomous body is under the administrative control of ministry of jal shakti the main function of the body is to manage and regulate the waters in the krishna basin in the states of andhra pradesh and telangana see according to telangana andhra pradesh has been drawing water from the right bank of tungabhadra river through a number of lift irrigation schemes this is now the bone of contention between the two states now what is this lift irrigation See normally water flows down the slope right because of gravity this is the normal flow of water in case of lift irrigation water instead of being transported by natural flow it requires an external energy through electric power using pumps or other mechanical means to put it in simple words in case of lift irrigation external energy is used to move water from a lower elevation to a higher elevation against the natural flow and that is all regarding this article in this context let us revise about the origin and the flow of krishna river in today's discussion see prelims is fastly approaching you can expect one or two map based questions constantly every year so listen carefully to this discussion it will be very useful for you now let us start our discussion see whenever you read about rivers you must focus on its origin and what are all the states it is flowing through where the river drains and its major right bank and left bank tributaries and some major multi purpose projects related to the river and if you cover all these aspects you have covered enough now look at this prelims question here it was asked in the year 2015 here they have asked about the tributaries of godavari see this is how the questions will be for this question of the rivers that are mentioned here in the four statements only indravati and Pranahita are the tributaries of river Godavari. So the correct answer is option D, two and three only. The other major tributaries of the Godavari include Penganga, Vainganga, Varda, Sabari, and Manjra. So now you know how the questions will be asked. So in this manner, now we are going to cover the river Krishna. See, the Krishna River is the fourth largest river in terms of water inflows and river basin area in India. after the ganges godavari and brahmaputra in peninsular india river krishna is the second largest river after godavari now where does this krishna originate river krishna originates in the western ghats at the zor village of maharashtra near mahabaleshwar the river after originating from maharashtra flows through karnataka telangana and andhra pradesh before draining into bay of bengal now let us see the major tributaries of the river krishna see koina venna panchganga vasna gataprabha dudganga tungabhadra and malaprabha are the major right bank tributaries musi river bhima river maneru rivers are the major left bank tributaries having seen the major tributaries now let us see the major multi purpose projects the first one is tungabhadra dam as the name suggests it is constructed across the river tungabhadra The next one is Sri Sailam Dam and the Nagarjuna Sagar project. Both of these projects are built across river Krishna. See the Nagarjuna Sagar is built downstream of Sri Sailam Dam. The next major project is Ujjaini Dam. See the Ujjaini Dam is built across the Bhima River. So now we have covered all aspects that can be asked in UPSC prelims regarding a river, right? we covered the origin of the river which is in the western ghats in the state of maharashtra and we saw what are all the states it flows through which is maharashtra karnataka telangana and andhra pradesh and it drains into bay of bengal we saw the major left bank and right bank tributaries the major right bank tributaries are koina venna panchganga vasna gataprabha dudganga tungabhadra malaprabha the major left bank tributaries are musi river bhima river and maneri rivers And finally we ended with major multi purpose projects which are Tungabhadra dam Sri Sailam dam Naharjuna Sagar project Ujjaini dam and with these points in mind let's move on to the next part of our discussion that is the prelims practice question session today we have four prelims questions as usual i have a quiz question for you now let's solve the questions Question number 1 which among the following is or are the components in solar energy policies of the government statement 1 setting up of 20 lakh standalone solar powered agriculture farms 
statement to financial assistance of up to 4 gigawatt of solar rooftop capacity to residential sector setting up of 12 gigawatt grid connected solar pv power projects by central public sector undertakings so we are going to find the correct statement here see here in this question all the three statements are correct see each statement is with regards to different schemes of the government related to solar we'll see them one by one see the statement one is a component of pm kusum that is the pradhan mantri kisan urja suraksha evam uttan mahabhiyan the scheme aims to provide energy and water security for de dieseling the farm sector and also generate additional income for the farmers by producing solar power The scheme aims to add 30.8 gigawatt of solar capacity with the central financial support of over 34000 crore. The scheme consists of three components. Component A, installation of 10000 megawatt of decentralized grid connected solar power plants each of capacity up to 2 megawatt. The second component is setting up of 20 lakh stand alone solar powered agriculture pumps. The third component is solarization of 15 lakh existing grid connected agriculture pumps. So from this we know that the statement 1 is a component of the scheme PM Kusum. Now the statement 2 is a component of rooftop solar program phase 2. See rooftop solar program phase 2 aims for accelerated deployment of solar rooftop systems with a target of 40 gigawatt installed capacity by the year 2021 to 22. See the scheme provides for financial assistance of up to 4 gigawatt of solar rooftop capacity. to residential sector and there is a provision to incentivize the distribution companies for incremental achievement over the previous year for the residential sector use of domestically manufactured solar cells and modules have been mandated so the second statement is a component of rooftop solar program phase 2 now the third statement it is a component of central public sector undertaking scheme it aims to set up 12 gigawatt grid connected solar pv power projects by central public sector undertakings they have to set up domestic cells and modules see viability gap funding support is provided under the scheme apart from adding solar capacity the scheme will also create demand for domestically manufactured solar cells and modules and thus help domestic manufacturing so these are all the three schemes that were mentioned in the three statements now apart from these three we also have other schemes regarding the solar namely production linked incentive scheme that is the national program on high efficiency solar pv modules The second one is solar park scheme or scheme for the development of solar park and ultra mega solar power projects. And the next one is off grid solar PV applications program phase 3 and the next one is Atal Jyoti Yojana phase 2 and the final one is green energy corridor. So just remember these schemes and know a few points about what the schemes are. Now moving on to the second question. So this is the quiz question for you. Who among the following threw a bomb in the Central Legislative Assembly on April 8, 1929? Option A, Bahad Singh and Badukeshwar Dutt. Option B, Bahad Singh and Sukhdev. Option C, Bahad Singh and Chandrasekhar Azad. Option D, Sukhdev and Azad. See, we discussed this in our discussion. Those who know the answer, post the answer right away in the comment section. Those who don't know, pause the video and try to recall it and then attempt the question. you will definitely remember it don't skip the question without attending it now moving on to the third question consider the following statements both president and governor enjoy absolute veto over state bills statement 2 the power to withhold assent to a bill only lies with the president so we have to find the correct statement here statement 1 see the absolute veto means the power to withhold assent to a bill passed by the parliament or the state legislature so after this the bill then ends and does not become an act now in case of state bills the governor is empowered to reserve certain types of bills passed by the state legislature for the consideration of the president and the president can withhold his assent to such bills not only in the first instance but also in the second instance thus the president enjoys absolute veto over state bills but on the other hand governor only enjoys suspensive veto which means sending back the bill for reconsideration of the legislature for the first time but in the second instance he has to give the assent so from this we know that statement 1 here is incorrect because president only enjoys absolute veto over state bills governor enjoys suspensive veto now the second statement 
what does it say the power to withhold assent to a bill only lies with the president see this is incorrect both the president and the governor have the power to withhold assent in the first instance since the question doesn't say which instance this statement is incorrect so what will be the answer here option d neither one nor two because we saw that both the statements are incorrect now moving on to the final question consider the following pairs river tungabhadra associated cities chittur muzi hyderabad krishna vijayawada bhima pune which of the following pairs given above is or are incorrectly matched so we have to find the incorrect pair here let us see one by one tungabhadra chittur this pair is incorrect because krunul is located on the banks of river tungabhadra not chittur the second pair is correct because hyderabad is located on the banks of the river musi third pair is also correct because vijayawada is located on the banks of river krishna but the fourth pair here is incorrect because pune is located on the banks of river mulamutha not the river bhima so here statement 2 and 3 are correct statement 1 and 4 are incorrect what we have to do we have to choose the incorrect pass so what will be the answer answer will be option d 1 and 4 only i have given two mains question here for your practice so interested aspirants write it and post it in the comment section if you have any queries related to the articles that we discussed today post that also in the comment section and with this we have come to the end if you find the video useful like share and comment and do subscribe to shankar ias academy's youtube channel for further updates thank you